I'm Park Howell, and welcome to the Business of Story, where I consult, teach, coach, and speak on the applied science and bewitchery of brand and business storytelling, so that you can clarify your story to amplify your impact and simplify your life. I thought it was just a stupid picture of a pig in the ocean. But after hearing that story, I had to have it. Now I wasn't just buying a picture. I was buying a story. Story literally made the picture worth more money to me. That's what businesses are about. People buy brands. People buy stories much more than anything else. I work with a lot of big enterprise companies, but let's just say I always tell folks, drop the PowerPoint, close your laptops, start with your story. If you want people to get engaged and you want people to act, you have to tell them an emotionally powerful story. That's with great characters, it's with uncertain outcomes, and it's with high stakes and drama. All business strategy is a story. When I started the business of story, my purpose was and remains to help people and the brands they represent live into their most powerful stories. I see their stories come together, and in doing so, the clarity of their purpose reveals itself all of the time during our Business of Story masterclasses. Case in point, I've had the distinct honor of working with the United States Air Force over the past two plus years, training their leaders from brigadier to four-star generals how to find, craft, and share their own personal stories. Now, this past July, it was actually on Sunday the 29th to be exact, I was at Lackland Air Force Base in San Antonio working with 80 generals and their staff. We explored why storytelling is more important now than ever to connect with their airmen and women so that they can recruit and retain the best and the brightest flyers in their crew. Well, I teach them the and button, therefore, to focus the theme of their stories. It basically works as the foundation for their story. Then, of course, I take them through the 10-step story cycle system, the process to help them create a narrative arc for their presentations. And like all of my audiences, the master class students I take them through, we dive deep into their stories and we work them hard. These generals were no different. In fact, they emerged with their own stories and storytelling techniques that they can apply immediately in their commands. During these workshops, we witness how their stories come together as the brave share their stories with their leadership peers. One brigadier general blew me away this past July when I saw how his understanding for story materialized right before his very eyes, and in doing so, how it would impact his own leadership speeches that he gives to our young men and women. By the way, young men and women who are mostly outside of the Air Force. I was so impressed with his story that I invited him on today to share it with you and how he learned to develop his story using the business of story techniques. Brigadier General Christopher Walker is the Chief of Staff and Deputy Commander of the West Virginia Air National Guard, providing command and control over the headquarters staff. He supervises the preparation of plans, policies, and programs for the Air National Guard units assigned to the state and advises and assists the adjunct general in that execution. General Walker's current federal dual assignment is assistant to the Assistant Secretary of the Air Force, Manpower and Reserve Affairs, providing oversight and input concerning laws, regulations, and policy of the human capital portfolio to ensure mission success. In this role, General Walker assists in the areas of diversity, force development, force management, total force, and airmen and family readiness. So I'm honored to have General Walker on today's show to share with you how he is living into his most powerful story by helping others find their latent leadership potential. General Walker, welcome to the Business of Story. Good to be here, Mark. Many thanks. Well, we were trying to get you on last week, but you guys kind of had your hands full with Hurricane Florence bearing down on the East Coast. Uh, yes, Florence uh, was not a welcome visitor, and we're just happy that she decided to downgrade herself to Category 2 instead of hitting the coast in a Category 4, four strength, because that would have uh, just stopped everything. Yeah, well, they're, the folks out there are lucky to have you and the International Guards all up and down the East Coast there to, to give them a hand to get through that. I imagine the cleanup is still raging on. 
It is. There's, and there's continuous flooding. Uh, the uh, dams are breaking. Uh, they're not worried so much about the pig lagoons, but more about ash and such mixing in with water. It's still a serious issue down there. The local authorities, the, the first responders, the National Guard are all pitching in to make sure that they get back to normal as quickly as possible. Yeah, well, it always blows me away to see how you guys spring into action uh, to help people out. And I mean, really jumping into the worst of things just to, to help people see it through. So thank you for all your service. Thank you for your support. Now, I one of the big highlights of my year, twice a year actually, is being able to go out to Andrews Air Force Base and also in Arley, Arley West Virginia to work with the generals and those that are newly minted brigadier generals all the way up to four stars to help them in telling their stories. So when I went out to Lackland in July, it was a little bit of a different uh, location, but it was fun to see another air base. And it's always such an honor to be working with you guys. When we went around the room and asked generals to start sharing their stories after we took you through the ABT and whatever, you were one that immediately raised his hand and sprung up and had a pretty incredible story to tell. And it was fun to see how it all started to come together for you in that room and then how you used it immediately after the fact. So before we get into that, why don't you share with us your backstory? Finds yourself as sort of the unsuspecting Brigadier General, I guess, as I understand it. Well, okay. Uh, (laughs) I grew up in New York City in Jamaica, Queens, and I'd always wanted, actually, as as long as I could remember to fly, because uh, JFK Airport was two miles from where I lived, and we watched the planes taking off and uh, landing all the time. As a matter of fact, sometimes as a teenager, talking to friends on the phone, we had to actually pause for a moment because of the, the loud airplanes flying overhead, coming in for their approaches. So, But anyway, I I knew that that's something I wanted to do, and uh, I really didn't know how to do it. Uh, And after watching TV, specifically, I Dream of Genie, that's the one that I recall the most, where I watched... I uh, Dream of Genie, huh? I Dream of Genie, Roger, (laughs) uh, Tony Nelson, uh, Roger Healy, but Tony Nelson being an astronaut and flying, I said, okay, so I think with the Air Force, that might be a good way to do this. And... From there, I ended up talking to a recruiter when I was a junior in high school. And as luck would have it, I was going to enlist, but as luck would have it, a second lieutenant from, who had recently graduated from the Air Force Academy came to a career day that we had at my high school. I went to Brooklyn, Tech high, Brooklyn Technical High School. We call it Brooklyn Tech. It's one of the specialized high schools in New York City. It, it's pretty much a pre-engineering school. Matter of fact, when I went to the academy, we used the same engineering book in uh, Aeronautical Engineering 101 that I used in high school. So, so I got to credit Brooklyn Tech for preparing me somewhat for the academy. But, but nevertheless, I saw a second lieutenant, I, that uniform, I said, that's the same uniform that Tony Nelson wears. So I said, okay, let me go talk to this guy. And I, said, and I told him that I wanted to fly. And he said, all right, that's good. And I said, I'm talking to a recruiter. And he says, eh. Don't talk to that recruiter anymore. I go, what, what are you talking about? And I was taken aback. I didn't know what, what he was getting at. And he said, look, do you know the difference between officer and enlisted? And I said, I don't know what you're talking about. He said, good. If that recruiter calls again, hang up the phone. I need you to listen to me. You need to be an officer. You need to go to college. And if you want to fly, you need to go to the Air Force Academy. You can, go, you can be an officer through ROTC and OTS as well, but the academy is the way to go. And all of these uh, things he, were t- he was telling me were absolutely new to me. And there was no internet back then, so I couldn't pick up a phone and go on Google and look this all up. I had to actually go to a library and dig up this information to confirm all the things he was telling me. And that's what I did. And, then I, and soon after that, I decided, okay, well, then I'm going to the Air Force Academy, and I'm not even going to apply to any other colleges. And <laughs> so eventually I went to the Air Force Academy. Uh, uh, but luckily, you know, lucky I didn't get thrown and rejected because I, I really didn't know what I would, I didn't want to go anywhere else. So the Air Force uh, Academy wasn't even in your sphere of influence at the time until you talked to that guy. 
I didn't know anything about it. Uh, and then after that, people uh, told me, hey, okay, there's an uh, I Love Lucy episode or uh, uh, you know, Lucille Ball episode where her, where she, her son wanted to go to the academy. I'm going, what, what? Uh, I missed out on it because I was a child of television. I said, how did I miss out on all of that? But after that, my life was going to the Air Force camp. <laughs> when I got there, uh, I said, what, what am I doing? <laughs> because uh, each and every day was a trial and tribulation. It's, uh, I have to say this. Anyone who does want to go to any of the service academies, make sure you truly want to go. Because well, give it, us an example of what you went through. What was one of your early awakenings there? Like, oh, my gosh, what have I got myself into? All right. Well, let's, let's start with just the military. Uh, the military part of it, where I grew up, is inner city. In my neighborhood, when people talk to you the way that they talk to me at basic training, that usually meant, okay, a fight was coming next. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so I had to totally suppress my personality and upbringing in order to get through this. I said, wait a minute, these guys are yelling in my face. That, that means I need to punch them in his face. But, uh, <laughs> but, but common sense took over and said, no, no, that's not what you do here. You want to make it through this. So I, I had to swallow all of that and, and, and uh, slowly change my personality. I got to say, that kind of personality is good somewhat if you're going to be in the business of war, but, but not when you're going to the academy. You have to have that <laughs> discipline and be able to hold back when you've got to hold back, I would imagine. That's right. <laughs> the second thing is, when I was going through high school, math and all engineering, everything was very easy for me. So I did not learn how to study properly. And then going to the academy... Any of the service academies, especially in an engineering uh, program, they're trying to shove just about five years worth of engineering in those four years. So you're taking anywhere from 21 to 24 credit hours per semester. And I think part of that is just trying to see if, how they can weed you out. That's, that's my theory. But again, I wasn't prepared because I, I, everything came so easily to me. I had to all of a sudden buckle down be uh, and learn how to be a good student and I gotta say I never really got the hang of that uh, my GPA can attest to that I won't tell you what my GPA was but at least I made it at least you saw through well you were studying <laughs> aeronautical engineering in high school is that right so uh -huh. you had this interest in flying and this interest in flight dynamics I guess between those two but you were really more interested in getting in the cockpit it, it, correct and really that's really all I wanted to do I, this whole thing about staff work and leadership, uh, that, I, that was secondary to me. I, when going through the academy, the mantra was, hey, you're not, uh, we're not preparing you to be a pilot or, or an aviator. Uh, we're preparing you to be a career officer. And that, that kept going over my head. Guy said, yeah, 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 that's blah, 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 career officer, blah, 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 blah. I just want to get in the cockpit because I really wasn't thinking about it. And I never thought that I would get past major, quite honestly. Then different things started happening. 9-11, all sorts of other things that started awakening other parts of me that made me want to actually lead people and made me want to actually make things better for the Air Force instead of just having fun. And I got to say, I was having a lot of fun in the Air Force. Uh, when I stationed at uh, Biloxi and hurricane hunters flying in uh, hurricanes and, and always deploying to uh, Caribbean spots. When I was at Little Rock Air Force Base, we deployed to Europe a lot and, and to the Middle East. But uh, also when I was stationed in Japan, flying throughout Asia and seeing all of those countries, I had a lot of fun. I got to say that I would not have seen the world the way I have but for the Air Force. So I have to thank Uncle Sam for that. So you were actually flying right into the heart of hurricanes like Hurricane Florence? Well, just like Hurricane Florence. We, uh, I ended up with about uh, 51 pe hurricane penetrations. And I'll tell you what, it's, it's not as bad as you think. And the C-130, C-130 is a tough old bird. And uh, what we usually do is, is pull back the airspeed, what they call thunderstorm penetration airspeed. It's just like if you're driving over speed bumps in your car. If you go over a speed bump at 75 miles an hour, your, your car is going to be wrecked. 
Same thing if you fly full speed in, uh, through thunderstorms, you, you're going to get the wing off leg. But if you pull back and go slowly, you can, you can actually make it through. And the, yep. the Hurricane Hunters were the only Air Force uh, unit authorized to penetrate thunderstorms. Everyone else had to avoid them. And I would imagine the wing off light is not a light you want to see come on. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's there. There is no such light, but that's a figure. That's one of our <laughs> uh, our figures of speech. Yeah, you get the yeah. off light, then it's it's done. You're done. I'm thinking you don't need a light for that. You pretty <laughs> much know when that wing comes off. Oh yeah. <laughs> so you and I were talking, and you mentioned when you were growing up that you didn't really consider yourself a leader, or maybe you had people around you encouraging you as a leader. And in fact, you were going into the Air Force to kind of, you know, go in for four years, do your stint, get out and make your way in the private sector. But your life kind of changed once you got into the Air Force. That's, that's right. I, I didn't realize that I would like it so much. And, and quite honestly, what I like about it is the sense of tribe that one gets in the uh, in the military. I, I'd say the Air Force, but quite honestly, it's in the military. Everyone has a sense of purpose. Everyone, it, when you deploy, I used to, you know, as a general, I don't do this now, but but uh, back in the day, used to sleep 10 of us to a tent and sleeping uh, a couple of feet away from the, your your crewmates, listening to them snore, scratch, and whatever they're doing in the middle of the night. But uh, you, you live like that for a year at a time. That really brings people together. And, and uh, I, I found myself looking at all the other folks in the Air Force's family. And I quite honestly, even the, the sometimes, especially in adverse conditions and war conditions, even people you don't like, after a while it's like, well, he's that cousin I don't like. Because that's that bro my brother who I, I have clashes with, but he's still my brother. It, it brings people together like that. And, and, and so that's what I found that I, I could not let go. And, and then I found myself also wanting just to mentor the younger ones. And uh, I don't know what, what awakened within me. I, haven't, I, I, I have no children of my own. So maybe that's the paternal instincts coming out of me. I don't know what it is, but, it, but all of a sudden I want to just uh, help raise up the youngsters, uh, whether they're in the military or not. Well, how long did it take you then from when you joined to become christened as a Brigadier General? That happened uh, the 28th of September, I got confirmed in, of 2017. So, so that was my, tw uh, my 29 and a half year mark. Now, folks who go into the Guard and Reserves sometimes take a little longer. Uh, in active duty, they, they know who they're going to uh, Raise up that. that they they groom them and they and they pretty much say these are high potential officers and they and they groom them and, and put them uh, check the boxes and get them up there. But in the guard, we tend to like to keep people uh, getting that experience longer so that it's not just a touch and go. It's more of a okay, you really know what you're doing in that particular job. Now let's see what you can do on the next job. Well, did you ever? see yourself becoming a brigadier general? Did that, that ever cross your mind? That was the furthest, furthest thing from my mind. When I made major, I said, holy smokes, I made major. <laughs> okay, this is going to be it. And then come 2005, I, uh, I, I knew it, two, sometime in 2004 that they had put, it, put me in for 05, lieutenant colonel, but I really didn't think about it. And then as I was going to deploy to Germany sometime in – spring of, of 05, I noticed my leave and earning statement, uh, my paycheck said 05, uh, 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 Lieutenant Colonel. I said, whoa, I'm a Lieutenant Colonel. How did that happen? <laughs> and then, and then, <laughs> That's a nice surprise. And I thought that that was it. There is no way I'm going further than that. But then, and I'm glad I listened to him. A buddy of mine uh, named Donald Reed, uh, who was in the North Carolina uh, Air National Guard. He's retired now. But he, he, he said to me back in 2006, when we were working together in the Air Force, when the Air National Guard crisis action team, he said, you know what, you should, you should get your, your uh, P-51 
PME done, your professional military education done for uh, what we call Air War College. Get that done. I go, why bother? He goes, because you never know. If someone taps you on the shoulder for a, a position, a job that, uh, that is an 06 colonel position, you want to, to say to yourself, I didn't get it because I didn't finish my PME? I said, you know what? You got a point there, Don. All right, I'll finish this. And lo and behold, I got that tap on the shoulder. And I said, whoa, look at this. Okay, uh, uh, so God's looking out for me, and my friends are, are guiding me well. He, so I, 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 thank, I thank Don Reed to this day. As a matter of fact, when I had my promotion ceremony for Brigadier General, he, he came up from North Carolina, and I actually had to say, that man there in the back, if, but for him, this would not be happening because uh, he, he convinced me to finish my professional military education. And, uh, I, the, the chance would have passed me by if I had not done that. And we all need mentors and guides in our life and our journey, don't we? If don't we're ever so. going to achieve anything of significance, it's always with the help of other people and the guidance of other people. And I saw that with you and you know the other generals and their staff that I was working with out at Lackland. And there we were in the middle of that room. It was a Sunday. It was very warm, I remember, out there, oh, as San Antonio is at the end of July. Oh, um, we had 80 or so folks in there, and it was a half-day workshop we were going through. And as we had worked through the and button, therefore, to get the construct of your story down, you know, we asked for some, some folks you know, to, to volunteer to tell us their stories. And you were one of the first ones to raise your hand and jumped up. And you had said to me, which I thought was interesting, that you have done a lot of speaking, a lot of leadership speaking, that sort of thing, and you're comfortable with it, so you kind of wing it, for lack of a better term, and trying to avoid the pun. Um, and yet now you felt like you had a process that could help you even create much more of a theme and get you way more focused on your presentation. Can you take our listeners through what happened to you that day in that room and how you found story to start helping you even impact the lives of more people? Well, uh, when you started off with your, your sequence with the backstory and hero and stakes, I, I, it, it started hitting me. I, because, yes, usually I go extemporaneously. I try to get an idea, and then I read the crowd, and I just start talking to them about what I think that they are interested in. I said, you know what, though, that's uh, – there. sometimes I will actually write down a few notes and, and uh, uh, expand on them. But I said, this is getting too hard for me. And when you, when you started uh, going through your sequence, I said, ah, there we go. This is going to make it a lot easier for me because uh, – with, with my adjutant general, uh, he is involved in a lot of things throughout West Virginia, and uh, uh, mainly because he makes things happen. And, uh, but he can't be everywhere at once. And so I, I'm frequently called to do speeches for uh, junior ROTC uh, classes, uh, chambers of commerce, uh, uh, different kinds of uh, – leaders throughout West Virginia. And uh, uh, I, I, I have to come up with something good each time. And I said, uh, when you went through your sequence, I said, you know what, actually this could, this could make it a lot easier for me. I, I, I could actually come up with something in about five minutes and, and just uh, keep it going. If, as long as I get audience participation, I can just keep it going for, uh, for hours and hours, quite honestly, and just keep uh, using your, your formula. Well, and by the week after that, you were presenting to the West Virginia State football team. Uh, that's was, right. So, so you had a presentation you could apply this to immediately. Do you recall what your and button there for to set the foundation for that presentation was? Uh, so I, I was going to talk about, so one of the things, let me uh, start off by saying, West Virginia is – is number one in, so, in something that is not good to be number one. That is uh, opioid uh, deaths and, uh, and drug problems throughout the United States. And so uh, one of the things that the governor has our, our adjutant general, uh, Major General James Hoyer, uh, doing is helping the uh, West Virginia government and uh, police and everyone, uh, uh, FBI, everyone to, to 
counter this drug problem. And so countering a drug problem, you got to take it, it's sort of a clamp. And uh, the left side teeth could be the, the supply side, and the right side teeth of this clamp are the demand side. Well, uh, General Hoyer appointed me to take over the demand reduction side of that clamp. And so that means I have to go and start talking to, to groups, hopefully, mostly young people. And we try, I try to get them as young as junior high school because uh, if we can stop them or at least push it to the right where they're starting any of that nonsense, uh, drugs, alcohol, then, then that could really help to put a dent in the supply problem and, and give us a better uh, bench of, of, of players, uh, of good citizens later on in case – we need to recruit them into the Air National Guard or Army National Guard or for just any jobs throughout West Virginia. Mm -hmm. so, so my thing, I was going to go into talking to the West Virginia State uh, football team about how they could uh, help with this particular process and uh, making West Virginia great by eliminating the drug. And, but I, I, I didn't know where I was going to really start with that. I was, I was just going to start with uh, – just explaining the problem and, and uh, asking them how they could co go out and help me. But when you when you started talking about your, your backstory, hero and stakes and disruption, I said, "There's where I can do this." Uh, they, West Virginia State uh, University. Most of those students and most of those players are from West Virginia. They they do have a diverse. Uh, student body, because I found out uh, the day that I went to speak with them that they have players from California, Nigeria, uh, New York, uh, Maryland, everywhere. Uh, and I said, okay, so I, I, have to, I have to change up a little bit. But, I was, but, but since they're here in West Virginia, they're going to they're gonna want to make West Virginia great. And then they can apply it to their own hometown. So I didn't, I didn't uh, uh, go off message too much. But I started talking about Okay, where I grew up, I told them how I grew up in my neighborhood and how it was, and I imagined that some of them had similar backgrounds. I, I, I started talking to them about, uh, hey, do you guys know that you all are heroes? And, they, and a lot of them looked at me funny, and I said, all right, you may not think that, but uh, when, you're, when you're fans, when the what, West Virginia State University fans are watching the football game. They're not just cheering for the school. They're cheering for you. And when you walk into a cafeteria, walking down the hallways, believe it, that there's some of them who are looking at you as heroes and want to be like you. Now, I, but a, a lot of you guys, uh, because of you, you are all uh, in this team together and out there on the fields and practice in the 90 degree heat and going through this grueling torture of practice together, uh, you bond with each other, but you're not really bonding with, with uh, the rest of the students. Because uh, let me ask you this, how many of you, and I pointed to the biggest, uh, meanest looking ones in them, when you walk into a, a coffee shop uh, or you walk into the library, uh, <clears throat> One of two reactions happens. One, people kind of get quiet and pretend they're just eating their soup because they don't want to look you dead in the eye for fear that you'll, that you'll uh, beat them to a pulp. They keep or, their head down, huh? <laughs> exactly. Or do people run up to you uh, greeting you and say, hey, how you doing? And most, and most of the players said, yeah, yeah, pretty much number one. I said, okay. So you know why that is? Who can tell me why that is? And I, nobody really knew. So I said, all right. Imagine, have you ever seen anybody run up to uh, a Rottweiler to just grab it and start petting it? Or do they usually go up slowly and ask the owner, hey, does he bite? It's because everybody, <laughs> I said, it's because humans have uh, an innate sense of safety and they don't want to do anything that might cause them harm. So they're going to wait for you to be the, the initiator of the friendliness. So I said, it's up to you guys because you guys look like, uh, pretty much like somebody who can snap them in half, it's up to you to smile and come up to them and show them that you're friendly. Because, because again, 
you are their heroes and you just don't know it. And if you give that smile, that's going to give them the opening to show how much they appreciate you and how much they think of you as heroes. And so I worked them through that first. And then I said, all right, now let's talk about your hometown. So we'll talk about right here uh, in, in, in Charleston, West Virginia, and, uh, and anywhere of your hometowns. You know about the drug problem. They all unanimously raised their hands and said, yes, of course. So I said, all right, so here's the stakes. The, you want your safety for your neighborhood and your family and your friends. And uh, if everything were going right, then you would be going back home to visit your family during your breaks and everything would be wonderful. Uh, everybody would be sitting on the porch not worrying about any kind of crime. Or whatnot. But that's not happening. So right now we have a, a disruption, a villain coming in. And, it, it, and one could think of it as like the, the zombies. And some of these drug addicts are like zombies. But again, it's like a zombie apocalypse. They're multiplying quickly. And the, and the only thing that can beat them back is you helping band the community together to, to knock back that threat. And, and, and I, I, I walked them through that kind of story and said, but sometimes you might not be, again, you don't know really how to do this because all of you were sitting here a moment ago not knowing that you're even heroes. And so, so sometimes it takes your coach, and I pointed to the coach, uh, or somebody who comes in to talk to you, like me, or, or just some member of your family to be your mentor and show you that uh, you can be that, that, that kind of person to, to help put a dent in this problem. And, and help lead the community on to a uh, better day. So, uh, so now, now that you know that you're a hero, or at least you have an idea that you're a hero, it's time for you to go on that journey and try it out. And, uh, and, 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 and so I stopped there for a moment, and I asked, I asked some of them if any, if any of them actually do go into their communities and try to build bridges in the community with the churches and such, and, and pretty much a, a few of them do, but, but mainly they, they like to have fun when they go. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> that's right. Not, right? <laughs> I said, that's understandable. At your age, that's what I wanted to do too. But we have a serious problem here. And it, it's going to get to the point where you're not even going to be able to have fun because the crime from all of this drugs is going gonna, is gonna to keep your fun from, from materializing. And you're going to be going back to woe all the time every time you visit your folks. So it's time for you all to step up a little bit uh, so that you can actually get back the communities back to normal so that you can have all that fun that you want to have. There was one particular, he's a baby-faced guy, but he, but he looked like he was about 300 pounds and looked like a solid barrel. And I said, uh, I guarantee folks in your community uh, uh, or uh, and some of your friends come to watch your games, right? And he said, yes. I said, so some, there's probably some little kids out there wearing the, the uh, yellow jackets, shirts, uh, uh, rooting you on. And I'm telling you, there's a, probably a kid uh, out there, seven years old, looks like a string bean. But when he's in front of a mirror, he's flexing, and he's imagining he's you. And, and this 300-pounder kind of laughed. I said, yes, because we used to do it uh, as kids, too. We used to watch The Incredible Hulk and imagine we were that, too, right? So, you, again, you're walking around as a hero, and people are imitating everything you do. And so different mannerisms that you have out there on the field, I guarantee there's some kids imitating you and, and pretending to be you and doing those same mannerisms. So now you don't actually have to go back to your communities and, and yield a sword and go out there fighting the, the drug horde. No. All you have to do, quite honestly, is – is lead by example. All you have to do is go out there and uh, be the best person you can be. And the kids are going to imitate you. And, and those are the kind of things that can actually put a dent in this drug problem. Because if they, if they see you as an example and you as a hero and follow the things you're doing and you're, all you're doing is the right things, then, then we have a win right there. And there we have our first victory. So, but but I but I, I use the, those kinds of examples as we, as we were talking 
uh, uh, to these kids. I mean, uh, it was beautiful. You walked right through the story cycle process with them. I mean, you just put your whole presentation together and used that as the narrative arc from, you know, the setup of what the problem is, pointing out that they are the heroes of this particular story and they're reluctant heroes because they don't even realize it. So they may have been brought up in family, you know, in households that weren't encouraging their leadership instinct in any way, shape or form. They happen to be good at a sport. They happen to be big. They find themselves now in this position to play football, but have never actually connected that to people look at them as mentors within the community. And so it was your job as their mentor to help them do that. That's right. <laughs> now, the previous night, the night before I went to do this talk, it was a Saturday before I did that, that speech, uh, the uh, Pro Football Hall of Fame was on TV and Randy Moss, who's a West Virginian, was inducted into the Hall of Fame. And I was in a restaurant that evening, uh, and they had it up on the screen, but everyone was talking loudly. I was trying to listen to what he was saying. And essentially, he did a, this is for us, and he was talking about for West Virginians. And I said, hmm, all right, so I, I need to get the transcript to his, his speech, and I, I wanted to see how I was going to incorporate that into the speech. But then when I thought about it, I said, nah, uh, leave that alone. Uh, let me just stick with this uh, the, the business of story uh, formula, because if I start trying to introduce all sorts of other things into it, it's going to knock me off the rails. <laughs> I need to actually, if I stay on the cycle, then I can, I can go on and on and on. So I, I left Randy Moss out of it. <laughs> well, uh, number one, I'm very proud that you were able to use the story cycle to do something like that. It's, it's the impact then that I have. It's not only just fun to go and an honor to work with the generals, but then to see how you all use it in the field, you know, in, in America and being able to go and fight opioid drug addiction in West Virginia by using a more powerful way of presenting through, through story and story arc. And so you've, you've done me proud. I mean, when I heard your story there, I'm like, wow, that just, you know, settles within me, supports within me even more of why I do what I do. It has to help people live into their most powerful stories. And you were a terrific example of being able to recognize that and run with it with your own story to impact these kids. You know, many thanks. I, I, I plan on using it again because I, I want to talk to, we have two wings within West Virginia, uh, the 167th airlift wing that flies C-17s and the 130th airlift wing that flies C-130s. Mm -hmm. But I, I want to start talking to all of the youngsters within the wing as well, and not necessarily for drug demand reduction, but just to try and motivate them because we have – we have youngsters who are in, in the services squadron who just cook food. We have folks who are in supply. We have uh, folks who are in transportation, uh, fixing vehicles. And a lot of them, when I go to talk to them, uh, I, I show up sometimes in their, in their squadron. They go, wait a minute, the general's in here. What are, what's, and, and they get spooked. But then I just sit down and talk with them for a little while just to kind of uh, calm them down, but I want to hear what they're thinking. And a lot of them don't, there are some of them who really don't appreciate what they're con contributing to the Air Force or what they're contributing to the unit. They think that, and some of them, they're kind of just uh, making their, they're do, going through the paces and saying, okay, well, at least I'm getting paid for this, but their heart's not in it. Not, and so I said, all right, I'm going to start using this uh, business of story to start talking to them. And I'm, so I'm preparing something maybe for <clears throat> December or January. I'm going to try and speak with both of the wings and get a, just a commander's call, get everybody out there and, and uh, use the business of story to motivate them and make them all start baring their teeth like the sheepdogs that they are. Some of them really, again, they don't know that they're heroes and I need to show them that they're heroes. And once I can show them that they're heroes, then everything else is going to take care of itself. And uh, we're going to we're going to start kicking butt in in every inspection. We're going to just do well because once people feel like they have a purpose, then you'd be surprised what they can do. Well, and it's when they start looking at their own stories and appreciating the impact that they have, regardless of their position within the the services in the Air Force, that they all matter. 
to, you know, they're all mission critical in their own way. And it's just getting people to realize and appreciate that by seeing how their story's unfolding. That's correct. Yeah. Uh, I haven't put that fully together yet, but, uh, but I'm, I'm working on it. And I'll, I'll, I'll try it out on some of my most critical friends who will not uh, hesitate to tell me if I'm full of it or not, but, but we'll see how that will go. <laughs> well, let me know if I can be of service to you. I would love to help. And I want to thank you, General Walker, and a very busy schedule to take the time out to come and speak with us here on Business of Story. Uh, it's been my pleasure. Well, keep up the great work and, and thank you. And thank you all for listening to this edition of the Business of Story. You know, if I can be of service to you to help you really clarify your story, to amplify your impact and simplify your life, visit me at businessofstory.com. And it's the stories like General Walker that make it really all worth it for me because that is my mantra. It's my purpose in this world is to help people live into their most powerful stories. And I'm hoping today that this episode was a good indication of how you can do that in your life with the people that you coach and mentor and guide and use story and show them how to live into their most powerful stories and that their journeys really do have an impact in this world. So join us again next Monday when we'll have another amazing story artist here like General Walker. And until then, remember that the most potent story you will ever tell is the story you tell yourself. So make it a great one. Thanks for listening.